so excited for today's guest. I don't know if you watch me regularly, you know, I always try to wear a shirt appropriate to the guest. And this t-shirt I actually got at his farm sanctuary. It says vegan, saving the world a bite at a time. I've actually never interviewed him and I don't know why, because he's one of the people that I really admire most in the world. I don't know if you notice that all the guests I have are, most of them are vegan, but all of them are people that are doing good things in the world. And this is no exception. Wait till you hear the work he's doing. As a matter of fact, he was voted Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul 100 Givers. I don't know what that is, but he's going to talk about it. And his name is Gene Bauer. He is the president and the co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. He's the author of two best-selling books, one which I have, which is called Living the Farm Sanctuary Life. And I'm honored to even have a recipe that I contributed in that book. So that's exciting. Please welcome Gene Bauer. Hey, it's great to be with you here, AJ. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So in case people don't know who you are, what, what is it that you do for the animals? Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, went vegan in 1985 because I didn't want to be part of a system that was causing so much harm to animals and to the environment. And in 1986, I co-founded Farm Sanctuary. And in our early days, we spent a lot of time investigating factory farms and stockyards and slaughterhouses to document conditions and to be able to speak from firsthand experience. And we would find living animals that were thrown in trash cans or on piles of dead animals. So we started rescuing them. And we then opened up our sanctuaries. We have one now in New York, one in California, and the animals come to us and they are our friends, not our food. They're allowed to live out their lives. People get a chance to come visit and to give a pig a belly rub or to, to spend time with cows and pigs and chickens and turkeys and other animals that most people grow up eating. And we want people to recognize that these are living, feeling creatures um, who deserve to be treated with respect. And when we treat other animals with kindness, it's actually good for us too. So. In addition to caring for animals, um, we work to educate and to advocate for changes in our food system. So we've been involved in the first laws in the US to outlaw factory farming cruelty. The first one was passed in 2002 in Florida to ban gestation crates, which are two foot wide metal enclosures where mother pigs are confined for their whole lives, unable even to turn around. Uh, we've worked on other laws, including a few in California, to outlaw some of the worst cruelty, such as the force feeding of birds for foie gras, you know, where they have a, a pipe shoved down their throat. They're force fed to the point where their livers expand 10 times the normal size for foie gras, which is this expensive delicacy that's sold in some restaurants. We also worked on anti-confinement measures in California in some of the initiatives that have passed we've been part of. Uh, and also one of our ongoing campaigns is to prevent downed animals, animals too sick even to walk from going into the food supply. So we do rescue work, we do education work, we do advocacy work, and increasingly now we're pushing for changes in the food system where government programs can start encouraging and incentivizing plant-based agriculture instead of animal agriculture, which is currently getting billions of dollars every year and it makes no sense. So we're, we're delving more into that now. Yeah. Well, if anybody has not been to Farm Sanctuary, I really recommend it. It's an amazing experience. And even if it's not your farm sanctuary, just to go to a sanctuary, because I think it's important for people, especially children, to meet their meat. And you had mentioned how you're working on stopping the cruelty in factory farming. You know what I'd like to see even more than that, Gene, is like stopping factory farming. <laughs> Yes, I agree with you. Stopping factory farming, even stopping animal farming and animal exploitation. Right. And right. Fundamentally, this, our relationship with other animals is what this is about. And in the factory farming system or in any system when we're killing and consuming other animals, it's not a healthy relationship. I don't think it's, it's one based on exploitation, extraction, killing, and, and, and disrespect. And if we can live well without killing other animals, why wouldn't we? So, yeah, we, you know, legislatively, you know, we've worked on incremental reforms, but I'm feeling that we're at a time now where there's more awareness about the many negative impacts of eating animals, you know, whether it's for the animals, for our health, for the environment, for social justice, even. If you look at people that work in these factory farms, they suffer terribly, you know, with the recent, uh, executive order from the president ordering slaughterhouses to stay opened, you know, forcing workers to go in and not only hurt animals, but subject themselves to high risks, and then creating a situation where the slaughterhouse industry is not liable 
And that's the other thing that happened with this is it's not only putting workers at risk, it's creating a situation where the industry is not going to be liable for the harm they might be causing to people. So, you know, with factory farming, uh, it has never taken responsibility for the harm it causes. There are enormous external costs. And when we start looking at those, you know, the idea of a cheap hamburger is, is a lot more expensive, you know, including heart disease and, and the rest of it. So um, I think we're at a time now where there's a convergence of awareness, convergence of issues, health, environment, animal welfare, ethics, social justice, that are all pointing in the same direction towards a whole foods, plant-based food, and a food system that is not exploiting animals or workers or the environment and not making consumers sick. And I think most people would rather eat food that is healthy instead of food that makes them sick. We'd rather support a food system that's not destroying the planet like animal agriculture does. And it, it requires enormous amounts of land and resources. You know, 10 times more land in the US is used for animal agriculture versus plant-based agriculture. And if you look internationally, you know, we're destroying rainforests to grow feed crops for farm animals or to graze farm animals. So this is another harmful impact, which of course contributes to the climate crisis. And then, you know, we're eating food that's making us sick. So there's, I think most people, when they think about it, would be inclined to eat plants instead of animals. And that's, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity now to raise awareness about that and to start creating systems that support uh, eating more plants and stop supporting animal agriculture. And a lot of that has to do with preventing government subsidies. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you can see the chat, Gene, and I don't want to embarrass you, but there's comments like, Gene is so handsome. He sure <laughs> is. Very handsome and kind. Gina says, I love Gene Bauer and all the amazing work from Farm Sanctuary. And Linda Middlesworth and Cap says, please, AJ, say hello for me. So hello from, hello. Linda, from Linda. So we have a few questions, and this is a great one from Marcy. Do you ever need interns? I would love to volunteer for Farm Sanctuary and help you care for these rescues. And Diane says, but where are these sanctuaries located? Because that would be important if you're going to volunteer. Yes, 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 absolutely. We have an internship program. And in fact, we've had it since 1986. We've been doing this a long time. Right now with COVID, we are not accepting volunteers or interns because of, you know, health risks and health concerns. So right now we're not doing it. But once we're able, we will again welcome volunteers and interns. And our sanctuaries are in Watkins Glen, New York, which is in the western part of the state in the Finger Lakes region, a lot of rivers, waterfalls, really beautiful. Uh, so that in wineries. So that's one of our locations. And the other one is in Acton, California, just north of Los Angeles. And we don't have live in interns there currently, but we welcome volunteers to the farm in Acton, California, and also work with volunteers in a variety of other capacities. So and check out our website, farmsanctuary.org. And we'd love to connect folks with activities that help advance uh, the vegan uh, animal liberation cause. Great. Caroline says, love your work. I think it's most important to expose young children to farm animals in person so they can become vegan for the animals before the bad eating habits of the standard American diet are too difficult for them to change when they're older. It's like that old saying, if you put a kid in a playpen and give them a bunny and a carrot, you know, are they going to eat the bunny and play with the carrot? I don't think so. I don't think so. And if you think about us as human beings, physically, we don't have the claws to tear flesh, right? You know, so we're not physically suited. And psychologically, we're also not suited to eat injured, dead animals. Um, you know, if we were naturally carnivores and we saw an animal who was injured or bleeding, we would start salivating. But we don't generally do that. So I think we are much better suited, obviously, to eating plants instead of animals. And it's, and it's good for the animals. It's good for us, good for the earth. Yeah. So, you know, you've, I'm sure you've heard the saying, I think it was Paul McCartney that said it, if slaughterhouses had windows, everybody would be vegetarian. People eat animals, and we're probably not going to change that, at least in our lifetime. Our ancestors ate animals, but they didn't eat the animals that we eat today. They didn't eat the amount. They, you know, they ate the sick, the slow, the weak, the isolated, the injured, but they were eating predominantly plant-based diet. And every now and then they'd have some animal products. They weren't factory farm. They weren't mass fed doses of hormones and antibiotics. So even people that insist they have to eat meat or want to eat meat, I don't think the majority of people know what is happening. So why isn't this on television? Why can't people see what's really going on? Well, I think a big part of it has to do with just 
power of the meat industry. They're very influential in Washington, D.C. They spend billions of dollars on advertising campaigns. Uh, and it's profitable for, you know, certain groups. And, 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 and most consumers, unfortunately, don't think very much about this. And the industry does not want us thinking about this. And in fact, they've passed ag gag laws to make it illegal in some places to document and expose what is happening on factory farms. And this is not new. For decades, the meat industry has tried to prevent consumers from learning more about the reality the production of meat, milk, and eggs. Uh, in, in fact, back in the 1990s, Oprah Winfrey had a show where she talked about how in the US we're feeding dead cows to living cows and this could potentially spread disease like mad cow disease and she ended, get, ended up getting sued by the cattlemen. So this is an industry that doesn't want us to be talking about these issues, unfortunately. And they spend enormous amounts of resources to promote their products and to make them sound healthy and fun and, it, and, and in whatever way they can to make it normal. And I think, I, I mean, I grew up eating meat like everybody around me. And fact is we are social animals. So we tend to do what those around us do. And if everybody's doing a certain thing and you see all these commercials and when you, when you drive down the street, there's all these different restaurants where you can get meat. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's so accessible. It becomes normal. And when I went vegan back in 1985, that was considered crazy. <laughs> and for many people, being vegan is still considered kind of nutty. But when you think about it rationally, it makes all the sense in the world. And so it's just really challenging our assumptions about what we're supposed to eat and encouraging people ultimately to make food choices that are aligned with their own values and aligned with their own interests. Instead of eating food just because we're, we grew up eating it, uh, especially if it's food that's going to make us sick, like, like with animal agriculture. And by the way, that's Pepe, Pepe here making some barking noise. So if need be, I might have to grab him. And no, that's okay. Put him on the show. We love it when, when, when dogs uh, come on the show. That's amazing. Let me, let me grab him. I'll be, I'll be right back. Absolutely. So guys, yeah, this is a, a great interview and this is stuff that people need to know. So please, uh, you know, I try not to bug you too much about sharing, but it really does help uh, them. What happens is, is YouTube then puts that up for other people that maybe aren't thinking or eating this way when you share. Oh boy. Hello, Pepe. Welcome to the show. Pepe. Yes, he's a you know, he's a, a vocal fellow, especially when there's somebody out the window. So hopefully he'll relax here on the lap, but we'll see. He's adorable. I've got my little one right here. So please, we never we never get upset at dogs barking. Yeah. You know, again, I just I just think that a lot of people don't know. That's the thing. And and yes, it it might be illegal to film now, but isn't there some isn't there any way we can just expose this for what it is because the people that know and don't care we're not going to change their heart and mind anyway but there are a group of people that really don't know and might care yes i think you're right and i think people are starting to learn about this i mean social media is a great way to reach people whether it's instagram facebook twitter um unfortunately though when you talk about mainstream media a lot of the images of factory farming are very upsetting and oftentimes people don't want to look at those and commercial media doesn't want to necessarily show it because it doesn't bring eyeballs to advertisers. It's not something that sells exactly. So, um, and it's very disturbing when you look at these things. And, and so often people will say that they hate factory farming, but they also say, don't tell me, I don't want to know. So they have this general sense that they don't like it. And, and I think one of the biggest obstacles for people who are interested in eating more plants and fewer animals or, or going vegan is that they're just not sure how to do it. And that's why the work you do and, and folks that are helping people understand how to eat well is so important because much of this is the how-to part. And I think increasingly there's a general feeling people have that factory farming isn't pretty. It's not something we feel good about. Uh, slaughtering animals and cutting in their throats isn't something that we like to think about. So we often just don't. And that's the problem. We don't think about it. So how do we get people to think about it? I, I think attract people with healthy, tasty food, uh, with positive experiences with animals at sanctuaries, um, and, and just showing folks that this is not that hard. And what we can do to normalize eating plants instead of animals and, and make it more accessible and easy. Uh, and attractive, I think, is the way we do it. Um, 
for many years, we've talked about the problems of factory farming, and we will continue doing that. But I think sometimes talking about the problems uh, is difficult when people don't feel that they can make a positive change and be part of the solution. Because if people feel that they have to eat meat for whatever reason, they feel disempowered for whatever reason, and they see all these horrible images, they just feel terrible. So I think we just need to provide opportunities for people to do the right thing, to eat well and to not support this horrible system. And then as people have those opportunities and start eating more plants, I actually think people will be much more able to see the images of factory farming and to really understand it because they're now not complicit and they don't feel guilty and they don't feel as bad. So I, I think it's a complex issue and human beings are very complex, but each of us can play a role in normalizing eating vegan food, bringing great food to family events or other social events and showing people that it's not that hard. And, for many people, I think that's one of the biggest obstacles. They're afraid that they can't do it. And so they look because it's too upsetting to, to, to think about what they're participating in. Yeah. Well, Jesse, who's watching live, thank you, Jesse, for always being here, has a great suggestion. She says, we were able to get all sorts of gross warnings and labels on cigarettes. Too bad we can't do that with pictures of animals being slaughtered on that bacon package. Yes. I mean, if people saw what they were supporting, it would, I think it would really change. And if it was in front of them as well on a regular basis, it would create a change. But but right now, you know, a lot of the industry's advertising has no clue or doesn't let people know exactly what is happening. And if anything, they make conditions sound a lot better than they are. Yeah. Well, do they not know that the current pandemic and all the other ones come from eating animals? And Dr. Greger predicts that it's gonna be even worse and probably the next one will be from pigs. Yes, yes. I mean. When we treat animals badly, when we confine them in filthy, stressful environments and feed them antibiotics in enormous quantities, as we do, we create a breeding ground for disease. And so you have potential risks of pandemics, but you also have antibiotic resistant pathogens that are infecting millions of people every year. You have, I mean, just the heart disease that comes from eating animal products and that clogs our arteries. So there are so many problems with it. And um, the Centers for Disease Control says that three out of every four new diseases are coming from animals into people. So when we have these unhealthy environments that we've created and interact with animals in an unhealthy way, our own well-being is also at risk. Wow. I don't know if you're the right one to ask this question, but I'm interested in your thoughts. So I've been vegan for 43 years and be, feel like beating my head against the wall, right? And then when Forks Over Knives came out in 2011, and again, I am so happy that movie came out because I think, at least in my lifetime, more people started considering a plant-based diet because of that movie. But part of me is upset, not with the movie, I love Brian and the movie, but it's like, oh, now I'm gonna do it because there's something in it for me. Because many of us who went vegan, like myself at 17, did it for the ethics. And it's not to say that once they do it for their health, they'll become more ethical, but, but then a lot of times they'll reverse their disease and they're like, yeah, well, I'll just have a little cheese, a little meat. And I feel like if you don't have a little bit of that ethical buy-in, you will you might not remain vegan, but it just kind of bothers me that people just don't do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. In fact, in, in supporting factory farms, even if you think you must eat animals, it's just not the right thing to do. Right. No, I hear you. And, and I agree that Forks Over Knives did an amazing job reaching so many people. It kind of was one of the first big waves of shift for health reasons that also connected to the ethical issues. But, but as you say, oftentimes people, you know, might do it for very much selfish reasons for health and not really have empathy or care for others. And, and that's unfortunate. You know, but I do believe that as people eat more plants and as they are no longer complicit in this violent system, that they are better able to open hearts and to understand the impacts of such behaviors on other creatures. Um, but each person is individual and each person will, you know, grow and evolve in their own way. And none of us is perfect either, right? So it's a matter of trying to, you know, for me, one of the ways that I've been able to do this work and stay halfway sane is to focus on the positives. Right, and to really dwell in that. Uh, it doesn't mean we 
should ignore the negatives. We need to be aware of bad things that are happening. But so often in the animal movement, uh, there can be a tendency to really go down a spiral of the horrible things happening. And, and I think it's important to recognize that that's not necessarily healthy, you know? And sometimes the anger and the angst of seeing those painful realities can motivate us to do good. And that could be a positive thing, you know, but if we dwell too much in it, I think it can be very um, painful and debilitating even. And so for me, dwelling in the positive, thinking about the good things that are happening, even if they're small. You know, if somebody tells me they're no longer eating veal, for example, it's a small thing, but rather than going after them saying, you know, the veal industry is, came from the dairy industry, what about dairy? Which I may have done as a younger activist, I will now just celebrate the fact that they care and don't wanna cause harm to a young calf who's been chained by their neck in a crate their whole life. And I'll, I'll celebrate that inclination and that desire of theirs to act with more kindness. Uh, and then as time goes, there might be an opportunity to do more education and discussion about how the veal industry literally came, was born out of the dairy industry. Unwanted male calves born on dairy farms were taken from their mothers and put into veal crates. So that's how the veal industry started because it was something that they could do and make money from with the unwanted male calves. The female calves born on dairy farms were raised to become milking cows, you know, because obviously the males don't give milk. So, um, but it, so I just just got to celebrate the small steps and 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 take heart from those and to dwell in those. For me, anyway, has been a big part of it. Well, God bless you for doing it. I so admire people like yourself and Jane Velez Mitchell because I, I I mean I think my work is a piece of cake, literally. I literally yeah. make cakes or make kale. But to be, to, you know, because I tried animal activism very early on in my 20s with uh, doing some direct action and civil disobedience. And I just, I just didn't have the the wherewithal to do that, you know, because I, I mean, I, I've never even seen Bambi. I don't watch the news. So, so thank you for the work you do to make, you know, our work easier. It just seems that, you know, you wonder like, things in throughout human history. It, it, to me, factory farmings are, are like a Disney cart. I mean, what I'm saying is Game of Thrones is like a Disney cartoon compared to factory farming. And, and I don't think people really realize the, the horrors that go on. And you wonder because throughout human history, we've had terrible things like, you know, there was child labor, things like that. Do you ever anticipate a time in the faraway future where we'll look back and say like, I can't believe we did that to animals. Yes, I, I certainly dream about it and I sort of envision it and I sort of, it occupies my mind, which helps actually. And there are people who have spoken of this that you wouldn't necessarily expect to have this kind of perception. Um, what was his name? Uh, Charles Krauthammer. He was a conservative uh, political, you know, talking head on TV. Um, he died a couple of years ago, but he was asked you know, there's this Politico does these like 10 questions. And one of the questions is, what will we look back upon in a hundred years and just be appalled by that we were doing? And he said that we're eating animals. That in a hundred years, we'll look back and be appalled that we're eating animals and, and exploiting them the way we do. So I think there's starting to be a growing awareness and a growing process around reconsidering our relationship with other animals and really thinking about who we are and who our fellow earthlings are and what it means to exploit them the way we do. Um, it's horrible for the animals that we're doing this to, but it also, I think, harms us. It undermines our empathy. And empathy is a critically important part of our humanity. And, and, and a lot of this, I think, boils down to relationships that are, again, unhealthy and where you have a power dynamic, where those with power mistreat those without power. And this can be humans mistreating other animals, but it can also apply to how humans might mistreat other humans. And when you have a power dynamic and somebody has power, uh, there's a tendency to abuse it. And so for me, meat is oftentimes connected to power you know, wealthy people, wealthy countries like the US tend to eat a lot of meat. And as other countries become wealthier, like China and India now, for example, they're starting to eat more meat. And the assumption is that with wealth, it's a good thing and eating meat is a good thing. 
and it all reflects power. And so is it a good thing? I mean, it gives one sort of freedom and opportunity to do a variety of things, but if what we do is harmful and exploitive, uh, I don't think it's a good thing. And when we're causing harm to somebody else, um, there's a tendency for us to denigrate them. And in the case of farm animals, we routinely denigrate them without really even recognizing it. Being called a turkey, for example, or being called a pig is not a compliment, right? So these are ways to put down a person which implicitly also is putting down a turkey or a pig or, or sometimes they do it with other animals too. So there are these subtle uh, unfair notions we have where we denigrate and put down the victims of our cruelty, you know, in the case of farm animals. So that's not good for the animals. And it's also not good for us because it doesn't really, I think, allow us to open our hearts and to live as kindly and humanely and humanly as we possibly can. So this is a system that is horrible for animals uh, and it's predicated on a power dynamic and I think on an abuse of power and throughout it, it, it involves systems of oppression, systems of oppressing animals, uh, destroying wildlife spaces, exploiting workers. Um, and it, it's, it's a system that's harmful in so many ways. And um, you know whether a person cares about animals or whether they care about other people or whether they care about the earth or whether they care about themselves, it makes sense to eat plants instead of animals. So one of the things I'm grateful for and very happy about is again, the convergence of issues and the awareness that is now starting to develop around how animals are mistreated and how that's not okay, uh, how we're eating food that's making us sick, how we're destroying the planet, how we're subjecting workers to horrible conditions that are you know, inappropriate and intolerable. So there's more and more awareness now. And, and, and then we have more alternatives to these animal products, including things like Beyond Meat, where you can go to Burger King. And I'm not a huge fan of Burger King necessarily, but the fact that you can get a veggie burger at Burger King now, instead of you know, a burger made out of cows is a big plus and it makes it more accessible. So I think those types of products and entering the marketplace in those types of restaurants is a positive step. And it really speaks to how things are starting to shift and how businesses are now starting to recognize opportunities in the plant-based food space. Nice. You know, you mentioned the, you know, people call people pigs and turkeys, but we don't really call the meat we're eating by the animal name. Well, I guess we do for turkey and we do it for chicken. But for the most part, people don't say, I'm going to eat a cow. They say, I'm going to eat some beef. I'm not going to eat a pig. I'm going to eat some bacon. They don't even say what they're eating. It's, it's like deception, you know, because like a, a little kid, when I had Brenda Davis on the show, she was saying that her son went to a birthday party, I guess, at McDonald's. And that was the first time he found out that the burgers were made out of cows. And he started crying because like nobody Nobody told him that a burger was a cow. Yes. You know, it is really amazing how we can become acculturated to accept things that are pretty horrendous. And children, I think, have a natural connection with animals. Uh, and it's important for that to be nurtured. But there are some times when, you know, children who have been raised by vegan parents start going to schools. And, you know, some of the questions on tests you know, treat farm animals like they have a question like, where does milk come from? And it's from a cow, right? So this assumption that we are entitled to take the milk of a cow and that that's what they're here for and that that's normal and appropriate is sort of baked into how we are acculturated. And I think it's important increasingly for there to be a recognition that that is not necessary. And really it's not normal for human beings to drink the milk of another species and it's harmful for us. And, you know, this idea of lack, it's, it, it's even, you know, the way we do it, in, it, it, it's basically racist because many people of color, especially are lactose intolerant. And in the schools, we're foisting cow's milk on the kids, many who will be made sick if they consume it. So this is a system where we're, it just doesn't make sense, you know? and I think increasingly now there's a pushback against what had been considered normal. 
and a desire for there to be a food system that better serves our interests. You know, instead of eating food that makes us sick, to have food that is healthier and actually nutritious and serves our interest, but also food that is aligned with our values. You know, instead of this idea where people say, don't tell me, I don't want to know about factory farming, it's so upsetting, people can actually go to a pick your own operation and pick berries or, you know, do a farm to table thing where they know where the foods come from, plant foods, of course, and they feel good about it. And, and that is, I think, the direction we can start pushing for, where we want to connect people to the source of their food, connect people to farmers. And when you're getting food locally, it's also healthier because it hasn't traveled so far. It tends to be more nutritious. Um, you know, have micronutrients in, in healthy soil. So, I mean, our food system has so many problems with it. And so I think there's many points of entry that ultimately all lead to the same place, you know, a yeah. local community oriented food system, you know, basically where yeah. consumers and farmers are. And in fact, you can grow your own food. There's a whole food, not lawns movement. People are gardening now with COVID. There's been a resurgence of interest in gardening. And we can actually produce a lot of food, believe it or not. The Victory Gardens during World War II were producing something like 40% of the produce we were consuming in this country. So could you imagine if like all the lawns right now that are you know, being mowed by a gardener and fertilized by a gardener could instead turn into gardens where the gardener, instead of just mowing the lawn, would actually be um, you know, delivering a box of produce every week to, to the homeowner, or maybe the homeowner would we be doing this themselves instead of mowing the lawn. But there's a whole other business opportunity in service towards landscape agriculture and um, creating beautiful landscapes with food instead of just lawns. So, I mean, there's a lot of creative possibilities here for solutions. Right. You know, you mentioned that for some people eating meat is a sign of wealth, but having the pauper's diet of grains and beans and potatoes, that's actually a sign of health. Yes. I mean, isn't it amazing, right? How this, this desire for power, for meat is clogging up our arteries. It's clogging up our hearts. It's closing our hearts, closing our minds. Uh, this is the irony of it, right? But uh, thankfully, there is now a growing awareness about so-called poppers food, right? And ironically, a lot of vegan food can be expensive <laughs> because it's perceived as elite. Again, ironically, but plant foods historically have been what humans have eaten. You know, that's why most ethnic foods tend to be very much plant-based, like Indian food or Thai food or Chinese food. You know, you know, here in North America, corn, beans, and squash, the Three Sisters Garden was a, a staple. So as we as a species started obtaining more power though, uh, and wielding it against other people and against other animals, meat was part of that equation. And, uh, and it's, I think we need a reset now and uh, to really recognize that meat comes with many problems, not only physically, but also I'd say psychologically. Right. Marina, who at least was watching live, we don't know if she's still here because she felt that some people were attacking her for this question, which I know you're not going to do. So guys, what, you know, it's a legitimate question. So let's try to all be kind to each other, even though I understand where you're coming from. She says, what about the small farms in France and Italy where everything remains small, small and animals are not mistreated? So without be, trying to be unkind to her question, my feeling is, is if you kill something, it's kind of being mistreated at the end of the day because... They, their life is just as important to them as ours are to ours. But again, people, you know, don't see that, you know, what's that? What did, what did uh, um, Ingrid Norkrug say as a boy, is a, she has a famous Thousand, saying. The, yeah, all life has feeling basically. And if, it, you know, like I think she said a, a dog is a boy, is a cow, a rat is a pig or something like that. They're all connected. And, you know, I would say that, you know, small farms where animals are outdoor, and you know, able to have somewhat of a life is less bad than a factory farm, but killing an animal is not good. You know, so you know, I think that people who are starting to think about these issues, you know, oftentimes come to this point where they believe that animals can be raised and slaughtered humanely. And you know, to that, I just ask people to ask themselves, 
whether they think the word humane and the word slaughter really fit together. And they really don't, you know? So um, small farms that are more connected to communities are certainly better, or I should say less bad than factory farms that are polluting communities and exploiting workers. But if we can live well without killing other animals, you know, I think that that's a heck of a lot better. And certainly for the animals, if an animal doesn't want to die, killing them, you know, there's, I think, an ethical problem with that. Right. Well, I love what you said, because Dr. Goldhammer says the same thing. Just because something is less bad doesn't mean it's good. What, what do you say to these people? Well, animals eat other animals. But ironically, other than the fact we're not talking about the wet markets in China, the animals that most people eat are not animals that eat other animals. That's right. And in many cases, you know, carnivores like lions, for example, don't have a choice. With human beings, we clearly have a choice. And, and it, it may even have been the case from time to time when human beings in certain circumstances, you know, had to eat meat or even ate other people to survive. You know, we're a long way from that now. And so today we are mass producing billions of farm animals every year, packing them into factory farms and then eating so much meat that it's clogging our arteries. So today um, there is no excuse for what we're doing. And, and there's in fact, a lot of harm by what we're doing. Um, and just because we've done something in the past, you know, eating animals, for example, doesn't mean that we should continue doing it. You know, otherwise, there are many things that had been normal that we've learned are not okay. And, and we evolve and hopefully as we know more and learn more, we can do better. And I think that's a big part of what our movement is about. It's, it's challenging assumptions, challenging past behaviors and then just thinking about it in a very rational way, you know, and living in a way that causes less harm, that is healthier and more inspiring, you know? And, and I, I feel bad, not only for the animals, but for people who work at slaughterhouses. You know, could you imagine what it would be like to work in a slaughterhouse where for eight hours a day, your job is cutting the throats of animals. And for many of these people, they don't feel like they have other choices. So. You know, some folks might be upset about them and I can understand that, but this is a system and people may not think they have other opportunities. And so we need to demonstrate and create other opportunities for people who are in animal agriculture to make a living through plant-based agriculture. You know, somebody who's grown up on a dairy farm and inherited it from their parents, that might be the only thing they know. And so I think we need to recognize that sometimes people who are doing bad things are not doing it because they necessarily want to. In fact, many times people that are on dairy farms or in animal agriculture don't really like what they're doing, but they don't feel like they have other options. So it's really important, I think, for us to create and help to encourage and support other options um, so people can have a life with it. I remember talking with um, Jane Goodall about this years ago about poaching. And one reason that people were poaching and killing wild animals is because they could make money selling them. And that's what they thought they needed to do for a livelihood. So we need to speak out against poaching, of course, but then we need to look at the system and that led them to that and create opportunities for these folks to make a living in more sustainable, ethical ways than poaching and hurting animals. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was raised Orthodox Jewish. And yes, we did eat meat growing up. It was kosher. And maybe you can address that because I don't think it's any more humane. But what was nice is I wasn't exposed to eating a lot of animals. For example, when you're when you're Orthodox, you don't eat any kind of pig at all. So never, you know, no, there's no bacon or ham or, or BLTs or club sandwiches. You're not eating any kind of shellfish. So I never had oysters or clams or, 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 or lobster or crab, which, which I'm saying this because some people develop a taste and really like I can't imagine without that. You never have milk and cheese together. So I never had a cheeseburger or pepperoni pizza because you just didn't mix it. So I, I never developed a palate of a lot of animal foods. And one of the other things is it just being Jewish, we don't hunt. I mean, you're not supposed to. It's in the Jewish law. We don't hunt. We don't wear fur coats. So 
even though it, uh, there were just things that we just didn't do and they just seemed like the right thing to do. But what about people that say like, well, you know, if we don't shoot the deer, we're going to be overrun by deer and we're going to be overrun by animals. We got to eat them. There's just, you know, how do you, you know, how do you address that nonsense? Yeah, no, sometimes people do say that if we don't kill them, they're going to take over the world. Well, when it comes to farm animals, again, these are animals that are being mass produced, oftentimes through artificial insemination. And the only reason we have billions of them is because we are mass producing them. And in the case of turkeys, they have been so genetically altered now that commercially raised turkeys cannot even reproduce naturally anymore. You know, they're all products of artificial insemination because they've been genetically bred to have large breasts because the breast meat is the most profitable meat on a turkey. And that means that they cannot mount and reproduce naturally. So they're all now uh, products of artificial insemination. So I, I think, you know, it's not likely that America is going to go vegan overnight and we're going to have, you know, 8 billion farm animals that need homes. I think it's going to happen incrementally. And as people start eating fewer animals, the industry is going to stop mass producing them and make adjustments to meet the changing marketplace. But when it comes to wild animals like deer, for example, one reason that there may be deer overpopulation in certain areas is because the ecosystem is out of balance. The natural predators, you know, wolves or whatever the predator would be in whatever area have been decimated by human beings. And oftentimes human beings decimate wildlife to graze, graze farm animals. You know, I've been to places in the Northwestern part of the US where you have sheep that are grazing and coyotes who are being shot regularly and in some cases displayed and impaled on fence posts in some sort of strange, I don't know why they do it, but so wildlife also suffers at the hands of animal agriculture. And sometimes the stories that we get are that we have to kill the, anim the, the wild animals to protect the farm animals. But in fact, the wild spaces can be made wild and allowed to be, and we don't need to occupy every square foot of the land, you know? And if we went towards plant-based agriculture, we could have a lot more land that could be allowed to go back to nature. And then these natural ecosystems would exist, you know, with predator animals and prey animals and just the diversity that is part of nature. And I think sometimes the best thing we can do is just to leave it alone. Um, now, in some cases, there might be some remedial steps that are necessary because you know, of the harm that's been caused, like maybe reintroducing certain species to certain ecosystems, for example. But in many cases, you know, when human beings get involved, we tend to cause harm. And I think we need to learn from that and, and have some humility and recognize that we are one species on this planet. Um, unfortunately, we have a very big footprint and we're causing a lot of harm to other species and to other humans. Um, but with power, and I think in nations like ours and you know, others that have wealth, power also comes great responsibility. And, and I am hopeful that you know, our species can, can evolve to kind of recognize that just because we can do something, just because we can destroy forests, just because we can exploit animals by the billions and eat meat like crazy, doesn't mean that we should. And I hope that we can now become more discerning and more thoughtful and ultimately make choices that are aligned with our values and our interests, aligned with our humanity. And, and I think that is fundamentally what we're trying to create uh, as, as animal activists, as a vegan movement. You know, we're not interested in putting people down. You know, we wanna help people live well. And in recent years in the vegan movement, there's been increasing interest in reaching out to farmers. And I often say that we're not anti-farmer, we're anti-cruelty, you know? And I like that saying, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. You know, somebody might be doing something that's harmful, but it doesn't mean that they have to continue doing that. And, you know, I, like I said, I grew, up, I grew up in Hollywood, California. As a kid, I did commercials for McDonald's, right? So. You know, I was doing some things that I look back on now and, and wish I hadn't done, but we all learn and we all make mistakes. And I think we all just need to be open-minded and able to learn. And, and that's, you know, so when we're looking at changing our food system and encouraging people to eat plants instead of animals, 
you know, I think giving people the benefit of the doubt, assuming that most people want to do the right thing, that they would rather not cause harm. So for me, that's a big part of, of my activism anyway, is really trying to appeal to people's better angels and believing that most people want to live according to their better angels instead of living in a way that is causing such enormous harm. Yeah, like you say, just because you can do something definitely doesn't mean you should. I wrote down what you said that there's the, the turkeys are so manipulated genetically that they can't mount or reproduce. That's happening to a lot of men because of heart disease. I had Dr. Terry Mason on the show and he talked about how impotence is the first, often the first sign of heart disease. And even our, a lot of our men can't mount and reproduce because of their high meat diet, you know? Yes, I mean, there are these interesting parallels when you really think about it. You know, in the case of chickens, you know, they've been genetically bred to grow four times bigger and faster than normal. So they grow so fast and so large that their hearts and lungs cannot support that growth rate. And they have heart attacks at a very young age. So again, their unhealthy condition perversely parallels that of our own experience, you know, where we're eating too much meat you know, suffering from obesity and have high risk of heart disease at a young age. So this is systemic and there are patterns here and we have the ability to make thoughtful choices that can make the world so much better. And, uh, and, that, and that's really what this is all about. Yeah. Linda wants to know if you're still helping John Stewart with his sanctionary, sanctionary, sanctionary. Yeah. <laughs> I go, <laughs> it's a new word. Yeah, you know, for a, you know, we, we partnered with John Stewart a few years back where he and his wife, Tracy, opened a sanctuary in New Jersey. Um, they are no longer formally part of Farm Sanctuary, but their work is aligned with ours in terms of rescuing animals and doing education about plant-based food. And they are growing food and providing healthy plant-based food to the community. That's great. You know, you talked about the the, the, the borders that how they suffer too. And they probably have, that's probably maybe the only job they can get and do you know anybody that maybe used to work on one of these farms that we could, that I could interview? Because I think if people heard it from them, how horrific they were, maybe they would like, listen. Yeah. I mean, there are a few people I could possibly connect you with. Um, and there are not only people that work at these places, but there are actually farmers who have shifted uh, because they just couldn't continue doing the work that they were doing. It was just too painful for them. It was just too uh, misaligned with their own feelings. And so, yeah, there are a growing number of farmers like that, thankfully. Um, there was actually a film about a farmer in the UK. It's called 73 Cows. And he um, was, was uh, you know, raising these animals for food and he could no longer do it. So he stopped. He's now a vegan activist and he's trying to figure out what to do, you know, as a farmer, you know, transitioning is not always that easy. There's another farmer uh, in upstate New York, his name is Bob Comas. There was a film made about him as well called The Last Pig. And he was a farmer that was raising pigs in a relatively humane way where the animals were outdoors, they were in the forest, but he would then send them to slaughter. And he could no longer continue looking into their eyes and sending them to slaughter. So he went vegan and he stopped uh, slaughtering pigs. And uh, so, so, and so th there's his story as well. And, and so those are a couple of folks that come immediately to mind uh, who had been in the animal exploiting business, who felt that it was unnecessary and it was harmful to an extent that they no longer wanted to do it and have shifted completely. Great. Well, let's end on a happy note. Can you, Zena wants to know if you could share a, a rescue story that might uh, make people inspired. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, you know, have rescued animals since back in 1986. And, um, you know, early on, I spent a lot of time doing investigations and finding animals who had been left for dead and rescuing them. And for me, it was actually part of my healing, you know, to see the cruelty over and over is very difficult but being able to watch an animal come to the sanctuary and heal is beautiful. And so, you know, one of the animals that I rescued way back in the nineties was a calf named Opie. And he was born on a dairy farm in upstate New York and sent to the stockyard on the day he was born. So he was a, a baby calf 
still wet from afterbirth. It was a freezing day and he was dying of hypothermia. So he fell in an alleyway and was just left there. So I went up to the stockyard worker and I said, what's going on with this calf? And he said, matter of factly, I got to bury him later today. And I said, well, what if I take him off your hands? He said, sure, go ahead. So I took the calf to a nearby veterinarian and the calf was very sick. And the veterinarian said, well, what are, we, what are you wasting your time for? It makes no economic sense. And I said, to me, this calf is not an economic unit. This calf is an individual. I want to do what I can to help. So she finally treated him. I brought him back to the sanctuary. He was on intravenous fluids and he was very sick. He couldn't even lift his head. But after about a day, you could start seeing the light coming back into his eyes. Uh, he was then able to lift his head, then he was able to stand and he was suckling from the bottle. So he was doing much better, but he really wasn't thriving. And I was wondering what's wrong? Why is he not happy? Why is he not looking very healthy? And then I realized he needed to be with his own people. You know, cows, like other farm animals, are social creatures, and they want to be with other members of their species. So I brought Opie up to the cow barn and had him in a pen there. All the other cows came and gathered around, started mooing to him. He started mooing back, and you could just see him starting to thrive. And so these animals have physical needs, but they also have emotional needs. And at Farm Sanctuary, I think some of our best welcomers are the other animals who feel safe. And when new animals arrive, who've only known cruelty and have only had bad experiences with people, and they come to Farm Sanctuary and they're around animals who are not afraid of people because they're treated with kindness, I think that goes a long way towards showing our new arrivals that they're in a safe place. And so Opie you know, lived with us for nearly 20 years. He ended up weighing close to 3,000 pounds and he was a gentle giant and um, amazing. To, to, I loved going out into the farm and seeing him and remembering where he had come from and just watching him enjoy his life. And as I was able to watch him, it actually made me feel good too. So it's good for Opie, good for me, good for everybody around us. And when we interact with animals in a positive way, it actually lowers our blood pressure. Uh, you know, as opposed to when somebody works in a slaughterhouse. I mean, that's horrible for everybody. So, uh, but, but Farm Sanctuary is a place where the animals get to enjoy their lives, where people get to come and visit and also share our experiences with them. And we love it for people to come visit. You know, when you think about how large these animals get, like I keep thinking, why don't they just mutiny? You know, <laughs> can't they just call? Oh, yeah, right. I mean, there's a, I mean, there's, these animals are, huge. I mean, 3000 pounds, but you know, they're, you know, confined and their spirits are in the industry, you know, and, uh, but at the time, they get to be them, themselves and they get to express themselves. And, and it's just such a beautiful thing to see. It absolutely. As Dina says, cows are lovely, gentle animals. I know they're Linda Middlesworth's favorites. Awesome. What Jean is doing. We need more people like Jean. So in the right now, we don't have more people like you. So how can we help? Like are, is, is farm sanctuary uh, available on Amazon smile, for example? Yeah, no, people can get my books on Amazon. You know, they, there's one farm sanctuary, Changing Hearts and Minds About Animals and Food was the first book. Then the second one is Living the Farm Sanctuary Life with amazing recipes, including from you, uh, to help people to start eating more plants if they're not doing that already. Um, people can our website, farmsanctuary.org. We also have an Instagram account, a Twitter account, and, you know, Farm Sanctuary does, and I also do. So people can follow us there. Um, once this pandemic starts to subside, we'd love for people to come visit the farms. Uh, people can actually stay overnight at our farm in Watkins Glen, New York. We have tiny houses and bed and breakfast cabins. Um, so that's a wonderful thing for people to experience. And just, you know, check out our website and sign up to get alerts because if there is legislation being discussed, we also oftentimes need to have people write to their elected officials. So please join our website or go onto our website, sign up to get our emails. And that's another way to stay up to date on what's happening. Right. Well, I really thank you for the bottom of my heart, the work you do. Last question. What is this Oprah list you got? And you're, you're always on the best shows. I mean, you, you really do some great things yeah. out there. So how, what kind of list did Oprah have that you're on? Yeah, no, I was very fortunate to be asked to come out to this brunch that she hosted out in, in Hollywood. It was 
her super soul 100 givers. And these are people that are just trying to make the world a kinder place. And, you know, many of these folks are dealing with human issues. So I felt very grateful that she also included people that are concerned about animal issues. So I attended that brunch and got a chance to meet her. And it was just wonderful to be among so many people who are trying to make the world a better place. And, and Oprah's amazing. So I was just, again, very lucky to be there. That's great. If only we could get her to go vegan. <laughs> yes. Well, she's dabbled in it. She's dabbled in it, you know, yeah. and uh, you never know. The future is still ahead of us. And I think she may continue dabbling and hopefully she'll take the leap at some point. You know, I just, if I could just work with her for like a month, I could get her thin and healthy and loving the food. That would be my dream job for just you know, it, a month. Yeah. I, I would love that. I would love to see that happen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for what you do. And thanks all of you guys for being here. And please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. when I'll be having a conversation with Dr. Anthony Lim, the medical director of the McDougal program. One of you asked earlier, how the heck did I get Dr. Lim on the show when he said no? Well, that's because apparently a bunch of you guys wrote him and he couldn't take the pressure. So he agreed to come on. So again, check out farmsanctuary.org and I'll have a link to a wonderful video that I think you guys would really enjoy. And again, Jean, thank you so much for this conversation and really for the work all, all, of, all of the people at Farm Sanctuary do and all the work that you guys watching do. Because I think that you're right. Everybody tries to make the world a better place in whatever way they can. And this little show that I do is just my little way. So, but thank you for doing the hard work so that I can just bake cakes. We, we all have our, we all play our role. We all do our part, right? So I'm just so grateful to be here with you and thank you. And let's all just keep plugging away. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.